tonight we're going over chapter four, and chapter four deals with the tissue level of organization. The purpose of this chapter is to learn about the various types of tissues and their origins, discuss how cells of a tissue are held together, compare and contrast epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous tissue. We'll, we'll uh, compare and contrast epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous tissue, learn about the structure and function of membranes, and we will also understand tissue repair. So we'll start with the types of tissue. And if you turn to page 112 of your book, there's some good diagrams there that we're going to get to in a second. We'll, the proverbial question is, what is a tissue? A tissue is a group of cells that usually have a common embryonic origin and function together to carry out specialized activities. There are four basic types of tissue in the human body, and they are categorized according to their structure and function. And that's outlined or illustrated for you at figure 4.1 on page 112. And here we have figure 4.1 right here on the PowerPoint. So you can see that we've got the tissue types are epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. Now in these tissues, there's going to be cell junctions. And really a cell junction is just one of a number of ways that a uh, tissue uh, can be held together. Uh, these are contact points between cells and they're called junctions. And you can see by looking at the diagram there that it's got a basement membrane, it's got an adhesion zone, and then it's got these little blue things here. And even this longer adhesion belt, uh, those are types of proteins that will be used to hold the cells together to form a tissue. So the first one we'll talk about is the intracellular junction. You can see that there are different types of those, and those cell junctions are outlined at 4.2 on page 113. But you can see first we have the tight junction, and the tight junction consists of web-like strands of transmembrane proteins that fuse together the outer surfaces of adjacent plasma membranes to seal off passageways between adjacent cells. So a tight junction is just that. The cells are bonded tightly together so they can diffuse in or out of that space. It's uh, very tight. You might even think of it as waterproof. So these represent the plasma membrane. And then there's some intercellular space there. And then there's uh, strands of these membrane proteins that help solidify that and hold them together tightly. Adhering junctions. So we see that at the adhering junction, it's a dense layer of proteins on the inside of the plasma membrane that attaches to both membrane proteins and to microfilaments of the cytoskeleton. These little things here are called cadherins, and they help to hold the cells together. And then we've got this other protein that we call plaque. That plaque then makes up this structure that we call the adhesion belt. Uh, so uh, we can see that this adhesion um, belt is made up of microfilaments and then we've got the adjacent plasma membrane there's a little intercellular space there so sure the space there is still small and not quite as tight as a tight junction but still compared to our next kind of junction we see that the adhering junction is a little more closely fitted together and then the desmosome is like an adhering junction but it contains plaque and they have transmembrane glycoproteins that extend into the intercellular space between the adjacent cell membranes and attach cells to one another. So you can see these cadherins like we seen on the adhering junction. So that's one thing that those two types of junctions have in common. But again, it, we notice that there's a little bit more space here in between the two cells. We see the plaque, which is really nothing more than a protein a greater intercellular space, and of course the adjacent plasma membranes here. And does anybody know what a glycoprotein might be? Well, as you know, the glyco would imply sugar, so there's uh, some sugar attached to that protein. That forms something that's called a cadherin, and that is another way that cells are held together uh, to form a tissue. And then we come into this next idea of the hemidesmosome, and hemidesmosomes, they resemble desmosomes, but they do not link adjacent cells. The name arises from the fact that they look like half of a desmosome. 
So let's see what's going on here. We've got the basement membrane. Well, that's something we haven't seen on one of these junctions before, right? There's no basement membrane there. There's none there. Okay, so this, this will make sense here in a few slides, why there's a basement membrane here and there's none on the other ones. But you can see that these glycoproteins, once again, adhering the cell to the basement membrane. Now, instead of called a cadherin, they're called an integrin. And then we see these intermediate filaments, and they're made from keratin. Keratin's another type of protein. And, of course, the plasma membrane there. So that's what a hemidesmosome looks like. And then we've got the idea of a gap junction. And at gap junctions, membrane proteins called connexins form tiny fluid-filled tunnels called connexons that connect neighboring cells. So you can see that the gap here on the gap junction is uh, much greater than the other junctions that we've looked at so far because you see here the plasma, the adjacent plasma membranes, and then there's a greater space here. And now you've got these uh, connexons instead of the coherins or the integrins. And that's the idea of a gap junction. So let's compare the epithelial and con connective tissue. So what differences can we see here? Well, let's have a look, closer look. So we see here on the left that the epithelial tissue with many cells tightly packed together and little to no extracellular matrix. You can see then that each one of these uh, dark purple spots is a nucleus, which would imply that this is a cell. And we've got another cell right here and another one here. You know, they're all kind of asymmetrical. Here's a a good way good so here's a cell here's a cell here's so they're much more tightly packed together and you notice that on a light microscope we're magnifying this 500 times on the right hand side here we see connective tissue with a few scattered cells surrounded by a large surrounded by large amounts of extracellular matrix so again these dark purple spots are the dark purple within this is kind of this purple is a little bit darker too but this is what we call the nucleolus and this is the nucleus and so we can see that these little dark purple so you can see the cell kind of outlined here again these are asymmetrical it's a little bit hard to follow but if you look really close you can see the boundaries of the cells well, so the, all of this light purple or this lavender is what we call extracellular matrix. And now these lines here are going to be some sort of a fibers or something of that nature. So that's epithelial versus connective tissue. Let's talk more about epithelial tissue. And now we're at 4.4 on page 115 of your book. So general features of epithelial tissue. Cells are arranged in sheets and are densely packed. Many cell junctions are present. Epithelial cells attached to the basement membrane. Remember, we mentioned the basement membrane a few slides ago. Epithelial tissue is avascular, but does have a nerve supply. What does it mean by avascular? That means that the epithelial tissue has no blood supply. There's no blood vessels that go into the epithelial tissue. However, there are nerves in that tissue. And then we can see that mitosis occurs frequently, and we'll uh, talk about why here in a few minutes. So surfaces of epithelial cells in the basement membrane. So the apical surface is the distal part of the cell from the basement membrane. And you can see here in the basement membrane, there's two parts to that, the basal lamina and the reticular lamina. And then you can see here that the nuclei of these cells and then what we call our lateral surfaces here and you notice that deep so if we're if we're looking at this as the distal end then we're going deep into the tissue and we see here that we've actually got blood vessels in this connective tissue below the basement membrane however the nervous tissue uh, goes through the basement membrane and uh, reaches to the um, the more proximal uh, 
area of the epithelium, as it's called in this slide. And you can see that slide at figure 4.4 on page 115. So let's classify epithelial tissue. Um, covering and lining of epithelia are classified according to the shape of the cells and how many layers thick they are. So you can see that there's an arrangement of layers. So one layer is what we would call simple. And then when you see this kind of long epithelial tissue, we call that pseudostratified. And then we can see the stratified tissue, which just, I guess the big difference here is that with the pseudostratified, you see the nuclei at different levels, and then the cells are kind of long, where the stratified, the cells are asymmetrical, but they're relatively the same shape, and they're uh, stacked on top of one another, where there's actually no stacking going on here. Another thing you need to be familiar with is cell, cell shape. So we can see the three different kinds of cell shape you need to be familiar with, and the squamous, which really just means flat, cuboidal, well, cub cubical, so it's kind of shaped like a cube, and then, of course, the columnar, which is shaped more like a column or a rectangle. And you can kind of see the different cell types here. They don't show the squamous here, but they do show these, I would say, are cuboidal, and these, I would say, are cuboidal, even though they do look asymmetrical. They're, I'd say they're much closer to cuboidal than they are to a columnar, which the pseudostratified would be more of a columnar shape. So covering and lining epithelial tissue. The name of the specific type of stratified epithelial tissue depends on the shape of the apical cells. So let's just quick review. So remember the apical uh, part is the free surface. So it's the distal part from the basement membrane. And if we were to extrapolate that to this idea of this stratified epithelial tissue, then this layer here on the top would be the apical layer. So let's see here, table 4.1. What does 4.1 show us? Oh, yeah, 4.1 on page... 117 shows examples of each of the epithelial tissues. Notice the similarities and differences. So uh, I'm pretty sure the PowerPoint goes through all of these. So this overview. So we see this would be actually uh, page 117, table 4.1a. So the simple squamous epithelium. And you can see that there's a single layer of flat cells that resembles a tiled floor. And what does this do? It lines the CV in the lymphatic system that's called endothelium, forms the epithelial layer of serous membrane in the abdominal and thoracic cavities called mesothelium, and also in the air sacs of lungs, kidneys, cornea, and the tympanic membrane. So it's present at the sites of filtration. It's got the kidneys and diffusion of the lungs and in the secretion of the serous membranes. And you can see it here. So this is the letter A in the book, starting on page 117. Um, so you can kind of see it there, how these kind of look flat. and It looks kind of like a tile, I guess. I don't know. The, Looking at the ceramic tile I have over yonder, and it looks pretty symmetrical. This is very asymmetrical. And then uh, here's another a view of some of that squamous epithelium. So let's go to the next one. The cuboidal epithelium. So this is a single layer of cube-shaped cells. The centrally located nucleus, cuboidal shape, is easily viewed when the tissue is sectioned and viewed from the side. It covers the surface of the ovary, lines the anterior surface of the capsule of the eye lens, forms pigment and epithelium at the posterior surface of the retina, lines kidney tubules and small ducts in the glands. And its function is sec secretion and absorption. And you can see the micrograph here. Well, it's got this nice cube shape, and it's got the nucleus right there, approximately center. And then here's a cartoon of that shows a very nice line there and you know everything's relatively centered as far as the nucleus goes non-ciliated 
simple columnar epithelium, single layer of non-ciliated column-like cells with oval nuclei near base of the cells. Contains one columnar epithelial cells with microvilli at the apical surface, two goblet cells. These line the GI tract, the ducts of many glands, and the gallbladder. Its function is secretion and absorption. Mucus lubricates the lining of the digestive, respiratory, and reproductive tracts, and most urinary tract, most of the urinary tract. It helps prevent the destruction of the stomach lining by acidic stomach juices. So it's going to secrete the acid in the stomach that you use uh, part of, as part of your digestive system. And here we can see the micrograph. And it shows the um, oval-shaped nuclei. And here's a cartoon of that that you can view and see that in contrast to the other types of uh, epithelium that we're going to talk about. Ciliated simple columnar epithelium. Single layer of ciliated column-like cells with oval nuclei near the base of the cells. The goblet cells usually intersperse. So you can see here uh, there's goblet cells that contain mucus. All right. And then this is similar to that in that respect, that it has the goblet cells too, except now we have cilia on the top. Line some bronchioles, uterine tubes, uterus, paranasal sinuses, central canal of the spinal cord, and the ventricles of the brain. And the respiratory, yeah, so this is what I wanted to get to. In the respiratory system, the cilia beat in unison to move mucus and foreign particles towards the throat that will be coughed up or swallowed. Cilia also moves oocytes from ovaries through the fallopian tubes into the uterus. So let's talk about the idea of the cilia in the respiratory system. So you've got these cilia in your throat and when you smoke if you're a smoker or you know somebody that smokes uh, those cilia get destroyed and then your body wants to cough up and then the cilia is going to start to move that uh, those toxins that your body's trying to, to force out that's why smokers will cough and maybe they they get used to it and they don't cough right away but over if they smoke for their whole life they certainly will cough as those cilia become destroyed in your throat, it becomes harder and harder for for the mucus to move up to be um, ejected because that's that cilia really uh, facilitates that process. So something to keep in mind. Just another reason not to smoke. And then we can look here at the micrograph, and we can see the the cilia. It looks like some fine hairs. It's not hair, but that's what it kind of looks like. And it's just really uh, just facilitates movement of these uh, particles or uh, mucus in many cases. Non-ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium appears to have several layers because the nuclei are at various levels. Even though the cells are attached to the basement membrane in a single layer, some cells do not extend into the apical surface. When viewed from the side, this gives the false impression of a multi-layered tissue. Therefore, pseudo equals false. Pseudo means false. This contains cells without cilia and also lacks goblet cells. Lines the epididymis, the larger ducts of many glands and parts of the male urethra. And if you don't know, the epididymis is a part of the testicles. Uh, this tissue uh, looks like it's probably more predominant in men than in women, but it also, it lar lines uh, larger ducts of many glands, so uh, women probably have some of this somewhere in their body. And its uh, function is just simply absorption and secretion. Yeah, so it shows here the, the parotid gland duct, which certainly women are going to have that too. And then we see here it's got these cells, pseudostratified, and no cilia, no goblet cells, so it's not really secreting mucus. The cilia, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium appears to have several layers because nuclei are at various levels. All cells attach to the basement membrane in a single layer, but some cells do not extend to the apical surface. When viewed from the side, it appears multi-layered. Pseudo equals false. We already established that. Contains cells that extend into the surface and secrete mucus. So it's got some goblet cells or bare cilia. 
This lines the airways of most of the upper respiratory tract. It secretes mucus that traps foreign particles, and cilia sweep away the mucus for elimination from the body. So here it shows a micrograph of that, and it looks like, it, yeah, SEM stands for scanning electron microscope. So this is another micrograph, but this is from an electron microscope. So here you really get the view of those cilia. And then here in this micrograph, you can see that where the nuclei are. And here's the goblet cell. Um, so what do we have going on here? Yeah, so this is just some sort of connective tissue. They just define it as a connective tissue. The base of the cell, the basement membranes of this in blue, and the mucus uh, in the goblet cell, and then, of course, the cilia here. So this is a pretty nice slide, actually. Shows the uh, light micrograph, the scanning electron, and the cartoon. Oh boy, stratus squamous epithelium contains two or more layers of cells. The cells in the apical layer and several layers deep to it are squamous cells. Cells in deeper layers are cuboidal and columnar. As basal cells divide, daughter cells arise from cell division and push upward towards the apical layer. As they move towards the surface and away from the underlying connective tissue, they become dehydrated and less metabolically active. Tough proteins predominate as cytoplasm is reduced and cells become tough, hard structures that eventually die. At the apical layer, after dead cells lose their cell junctions and are sloughed off, they are replaced continuously as new cells emerge from the basal cells. In two types of these cells, you got the keratinized stratus, stratified squamous epithelium, and that just simply means it contains keratin, which is a protein. Uh, like, for instance, your fingernails are uh, high in keratin. So if that gives you an idea. You're, you know, your hair is protein, too. So your your fingernails, they just have more keratin in them than, than your hair does. And then the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that do not contain large amounts of keratin. So location is a keratinized variety forms a superficial layer of the skin. So... You do have some keratin in your skin, and then the non-keratinized variety lines wet surfaces. So in your mouth, esophagus, part of the epiglottis, um, the pharynx, and the vagina, and it also covers the tongue. Uh, protection against abrasion, water, uh, UV radiation, and foreign invasion. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to kind of give you a little philosophy here now. First line of defense against microbes. It's not actually true. As you know, being in sophomore biology, that your skin is full of what we call normal flora. And that normal flora is just a line of uh, microbes that live on your skin. They essentially live in symbiosis with you. And that, to me, is really the first line of defense against microbes because uh, sometimes if a foreign microbe gets on your skin, maybe the good bacteria that's actually living on your skin can help to uh, fend off some of that. But if we uh, take the normal flora out of the equation, then, yeah, certainly a stratified squamous epithelium that we have in our uh, mouths, in our esophagus, et cetera, is going to help form a defense line against uh, those organisms that want to do us harm. And now we see a micrograph here. You can see a little uh, more magnification here, these non-keratinized cells. So this would be the surface. And it's trying to show you that uh, the non-keratinized or dead cells are here on the surface. And we can see the nucleus of the living cell here. And then if we look at the cartoon over here, see how, remember the squamous cells, squamous just means flat. And then as we go deeper into the tissue, uh, we can see these kind of become cuboidal or columnar uh, by the time they reach the basement membrane. And now it's uh, showing us once again skin. So this is going to be the outside of the body here. And we can see that on your skin, you've got like this loose keratinized. Again, it's, it's I'm just saying loose because it's, it's not as concentrated as it would be on your fingernails. If you can hear my fingernail, right? But, you know, can you, 
it's just it's there's a keratin here but this keratin in your fingernail is more concentrated and now uh, the uh, stratified cuboidal epithelium has two or more layers of cells cells in the apical layer are cube shaped and fairly rare they're fairly rare that where it says rate that's a typo that's supposed to say rare a location ducts of adult sweat glands esophageal glands and part of the male urethra protection uh, limited secretion and absorption so the male urethra is a little bit different from the female urethra for one thing uh, the males they have longer urethras than females do for obvious reasons and also uh, their urethra needs to be a little more adaptable to stretching that uh, be caused during sexual arousals and its function is the protection and then the limited secretion and absorption we've got this micrograft here you can see this lumen or this duct and then the nuclei of the stratified cuboidal cells and we see the cuboidal cells here and there, of course, you got the apical surface, and then you've got another layer there. It's, well, I would say it's deep to the apical surface, that's for sure. And then that's connected to your basement membrane and connective tissue. So we've seen that. It's kind of been a theme throughout all of these epithelial slides, that they all seem to be connected to the basement membrane. Stratified columnar epithelium. So the basal layers consist of shortened, irregularly shaped, cells only the apical layer has columnar cells and this is uncommon so it lines part of the urethra the large excretory ducts of some glands such as the esophageal glands the small areas in the anal mucous membrane and part of the conjunctiva of the eye its function is to protect and to secrete so we're looking at a pharynx here and we see the, let's look at the cartoon. We see the apical surface and then deep. We see another layer of those cells, the stratified columnar epithelium. You can see it here in the micrograph. And then of course the basement membrane and the connective tissue. Urothelium or transitional epithelium has variable appearance in relaxed or unstretched state, looks stratified looks like stratified cuboidal epithelium except the apical layer cells tend to be large and rounded as tissue is stretched cells become flatter giving the appearance of stratus stratified squamous epithelium multiple layers and elasticity make it ideal for lining hollow structures of the urinary bladder subject to expansion from within so this lines the urinary bladder the ureters and portions of the urethra so the ureter is the part of the body that comes off of the kidneys into the bladder and then the the bladder obviously uh, needs to be able to stretch too because as you uh, accumulate um, waste products from your kidney your bladder can expand and contract depending on how much urine you have stored up so the function is to allow urinary organs to stretch. It's basically what I just said, and maintain a protective lining while holding variable amounts of fluid without rupture. So glandular epithelium. A gland is a single cell mass of epithelial cells adapted for secretion. Two kinds of glands that you should be familiar with, and that's the endocrine glands, which secrete the interstitial fluid, and they diffuse it into the bloodstream. And then the second kind is the exocrine glands. The exocrine glands have ducts that empty onto the surface of a covering or lining uh, epithelium. Uh, this will be found like on the surface of the skin. Your uh, sweat glands are examples of exocrine glands is what I'm trying to say. And then the lumen of the stomach, the ones that secrete the stomach acid, those are exocrine. Yeah, the ones that secrete your saliva are exocrine. And then the, the endocrine are just going to be more like the hormones. So when your body secretes hormones, those are a part of your endocrine glands or your endocrine system. So let's uh, go through this endocrine gland secretions, hormones, as I just said, inter enter the interstitial fluid and then diffuse into the bloodstream without flowing through a duct. Endocrine glands will be described in detail in chapter 18. So the pituitary gland at the base of the brain, the pineal gland, the thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal glands, the pancreas, and the ovaries and the pelvic testes 
the thymus and the in the thoracic cavity. So those are examples of endocrine glands. And hormones regulate many metabolic and physiological activities and help to maintain homeostasis. This is an example of an endocrine gland. It's the thyroid gland. And you can see these cell types going around here. And it's got this follicle. This is what the, the lumen. And then this is the hormone producing epithelial cell. So it stores some of the precursor, it stores it in here. And then this can be uh, released into your bloodstream uh, if it's needed. Like the best example I can think of off the top of my head is the adrenal glands. You know, if you go into fight or flight mode, your, your adrenal glands are going to kick in and you're going to get this boost of adrenaline. And that's basically how it works. And then the exocrine glands are secretory products that are released into ducts that empty onto the surface of a covering and lining epithelium. Skin surface or lumen of the lumen of hollow organs. Sweat, oil, earwax, uh, digestive glands such as salivary glands, the pancreas, and their function is to produce substances such as sweat to help lower the body temperature, earwax, like all of those body fluids essentially are a result of exocrine glands and we can see here in a micrograph um, how they kind of look. They've got the lumen there. So we're, so we're looking at a sweat gland, the nuclei of the cells. And then, of course, we've got a basement membrane, which has been a common theme that we've seen throughout all these slides. Structural classification of glandular epithelium. I want to give you a reference for your book because I just went through all those slides and follow along with that. Um, yeah, so uh, this is on page 124. So uh, unicellular, or it means a single cell, and then uh, an example of that is the goblet cells, and then we've got the multicellular, which means they're composed of many cells and form a distinctive microscopic structure or macroscopic organ. This is uh, sweat glands, oil glands, and salivary glands. And now we see here, this is figure 4.6 on page 125. Um, so we can see these different types of exocrine glands here. Um, so I would recommend that you go over that figure and uh, become familiar with those structures. The function of the glandular epithelium. This is on page 126, figure 4.7. So we can see the salivary glands, the mammary glands, and the skin. They all are, have uh, these uh, secretions and secrete. It's got a secretory vesicle, the Golgi complex. So this is actually in the cell. So this is going to be the nucleus. And this is going to be the ER. And it looks to me like it's smooth ER. I'm sure there's some rough ER in there somewhere. Maybe this part here is rough ER, and that goes into the Golgi apparatus that's going to uh, package up that saliva and then send it out or excrete it into the mouth. And so it could be something as simple as uh, smelling your dinner. It could make your salivary, activate your salivary glands or uh, tasting a, a tasty dish at dinner um, that could activate your salivary glands. And that's uh, the beginning of the digestive process there. And, now we kind of see the same thing here going on with the mammary gland. It's secreted a little different, so it's a pinched off portion of the cell is secreted. Um, so, but we see kind of the same process here. You know, it goes through the uh, Golgi and then uh, comes out, it gets packaged, and then it's going to break off into this, this blob of, well, I mean, milk is like a, you know, lactose is a, milk sugar so yeah i mean there's going to be lipids and carbohydrates in there for sure and it just gets packaged like that and that forms the milk uh, and then of uh, sebaceous glands uh, so sebaceous glands are in the, the skin see here a mature cell uh, dies and becomes a secretory product cell division so yeah this is more of the outside of the skin distal end of the penis is rich in sebaceous glands so the tip of the penis is going to uh, produce this oil and uh, that's that tissue is very rich in those glands it's just the best example i can think of off the top of my head uh, let's talk about connective tissue 
general features of connective tissue. Uh, we're lecturing at 4.5 on page 127. It consists of two basic elements, cells and the extracellular matrix. Connective tissue cells do not have any free surfaces. Connective tissue is highly vascularized and has a nerve supply. And the exceptions to that vascularization and nerve supply are the tendons and cartilage, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. So we can see here a broad overview of the different types of connective tissue cells. And this is figure 4.8 on page 128. So we can just see uh, there's all these different types of cells. This ground substance is important. We're going to talk about that. Um, so this looks to me like it's a blood vessel. And these yellow ones represent nerves. Blue ones are fibers. And then you can see different types of cells in here. So this is a good uh, figure to study because it gives you a broad overview of what we're going to talk about. The extracellular matrix is located in the spaces between the connective tissue cells. The extracellular matrix is composed of fibers and ground substance. So this like pinkish salmon color here in the back, this is the ground substance. And these blue things are the fiber. And uh, this is located in the spaces between the connective tissue cells. And you can see here are these different cells. So this is located in between the cells, the ground substance here in between the cells, the fibers in between the cells, etc. Fibers in the extracellular matrix provide strength and support to a tissue. Collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers. So we can see here in the micrograph, collagen and this elastic fiber. It's not showing us any reticular fibers. I wonder why. Classification of connective tissue. So there's basically two types of connective tissue. Embryonic. In embryonic connective tissue, you've got the mesenchyme and the mucus. So the embryo starts out with these two basic types of connective tissue. So here's some reticular fiber here. It's not really, still not really pointing it out in our cartoon. Another thing I wanted to say was this uh, idea of the mesenchyme is mostly uh, what's making up the embryo at this point in the development. And then most of the mucoid connective tissue is going to be found in the umbilical cord. Secondly, we have mature connective tissue, and there's five types that you need to be familiar with that. That's loose, dense, cartilage, bone, and blood. So hyaline cartilage contains resilient gel as ground substance and appears as a bluish-white shiny substance. Prominent chondrocytes are found in the cartilage lacunae surrounded by chrondium. Exceptions are articular cartilage in joints and cartilage of growth plates where bones lengthen during growth. Most abundant cartilage in the body uh, at the end of the bones. And so it's found at the end of bones and the interior ends of the ribs. The nose is made up of cartilage, parts of the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchial tubes, and embryonic and fetal skeleton. Provide smooth surfaces for movement at joints, flexibility, and support. Weakest type of cartilage can be fractured. Fibrous cartilage. So we are now uh, lecturing from table 4.4. And that starts on page 131. And this uh, fibrous cartilage slide is page 136. Table 4.6 is where we're, we're at now as of this slide. Has chondrocytes among clearly visible thick bundles of collagen fibers within the extracellular matrix, and it lacks a perichondrium. It's lo located in the pubic symphysis, the intervertebral discs, the menisci of the knee, portions of tendons that insert into the cartilage. Support and joining structures together is its function. It has strength and rigidity to make it the strongest type of cartilage. So you can see here at the vertebra, it has the ability to compress. You know, your back is a very uh, strong uh, part of your body. And in between each of those vertebrae, there's a little bit of cartilage that gives you some cushion. Now, uh, if this cartilage was to become wore out or damaged, 
and then you know you can do the spinal fusion for that but this is very resilient type of body tissue here and then we've got the elastic cartilage has chrondocytes and a thread like network of elastic fibers within the extracellular matrix and the perichondrium present the top of the um, epiglottis top of the larynx the epiglottis is made of cartridge this elastic cartilage and then uh, the external part of the ear the auricle the eustachian tubes uh, make are made up of this type of cartilage and it provides strength and elasticity and it maintains the shape of certain structures so you can kind of see it here on the micrograph and then this is a nice cartoon of it mature connective tissue supporting connective tissue bone tissue Compact bone tissue consists of osteons that contain bone lamellae and bone lacunae, osteocytes, bone canaliculi, and central canals. Spongy bone tissue consists of thin columns called beculae. Spaces between the trabeculae are filled with red bone marrow. Both compact and spongy bone tissue make up the various parts of the bones of the body. Support, protection, storage, houses blood, forming tissue, serves as levers that act with muscle in order to enable movement. So basically it's showing you here a micrograph of a bone. And you can see these lacunae there. This is a lacuna, which is a, a singular for that. And I think lacunae, just, I think in Latin it means a lake. You can see this bone lamella there this kind of going from the center here to this it almost looks like a tree if you look at it that way and then you can see the cartoon here you see the osteocyte you see the lacuna and the canaliculi this is just the details of the osteocyte in cartoon form liquid connective tissue blood consists of blood plasma and formed elements red blood cells white blood cells and platelets within blood vessels within chambers of the heart. Red blood cells transport oxygen and some carbon dioxide. White blood cells carry uh, out phagocytosis and mediate allergic reactions and immune responses. The platelets are essential for clotting. So if you get a cut, these platelets are going to come in and help to clot that blood, and that helps to prevent microorganisms from getting into your bloodstream. So you can see here uh, the red blood cells are kind of they're a little bit differently shaped white blood cells and then the platelets so uh, that was one thing i pointed out on quiz zero because there were several students who answered that with the dna question or the what what do all cells have in common um, all of then some students would say all cells have dna not all cells have dna the red blood cell is an example of a cell which does not have dna let's see here membranes start on page 139 we're talking from 4.6 right now. Membranes are flat sheets of pliable tissue that cover or line a part of the body. Two types of membranes. Epithelial membranes, that includes the mucous membranes, the serous membranes, and the cutaneous membranes. And then secondly, the synovial membranes. So here we see the small intestine lining we can see the goblet cells and we can see some mucus there forming as a result of those cells and this is the epithelium the mucous membranes line body cavities that open to the outside and line organs of these cavities and then we see the serous membrane here and that's the lung so the pleura it's located in there we see this serous membrane and then we've got this serous fluid this mesothelium and the serous membranes line body cavities that do not open directly to the outside and cover organs in those cavities. Then we've got the skin. So the skin covers the surface of the body and that contains the articular cavity. So another thing I like to point out about the skin is that the skin is actually the largest organ of the body. And then you can see these uh, synovial membrane is find that at joints so this is like a bone here this looks like maybe an, an elbow or something doesn't say what it is uh, but the synovial membranes line joints that contain the anarticular cavity so you can see the articular cavity 
I know people who have had bone on bone, and I, I know that they've told me it's very painful. Uh, so what happens when it becomes bone on bone, there's been some damage or over time it wears out and uh, you start to lose that cushion of the synovial fluid in that articular cavity and then the bone starts grinding on bone and then you got to get into these surgical procedures. So let's talk about muscle now. The muscular tissue consists of fibers that provide motion, maintain posture, and produce heat. There's three types of muscle tissue, the skeletal muscle, the cardiac muscle, and the smooth muscle. The skeletal muscle tissue consists of long cylindrical striated fibers. They vary greatly in length from a few centimeters in short muscles to the longest muscles. A muscle fiber is roughly cylindrical, multinucleated. It's a multinucleated cell with the nuclei at the periphery. It is voluntary because it can be made to contract or relax by conscious control. It's usually attached to bones by tendons. Its function is motion, posture, heat production, and protection. So you can see here this longitudinal section of the muscle cell. You see the, the nucleus here. And remember, this cell is what they call multinucleated. So there's more than one nucleus in the cell. So here's a skeletal muscle fiber with its striations and its uh, multinucleated characteristics. We're now in 4.7 on page 141, turning to page 142. Cardiac muscle. This consists of branched, striated fibers with usually only one centrally located nucleus. It attaches end-to-end -end by transverse thickenings of the plasma membrane called intercalated discs, which contain desmosomes and gap junctions. Remember, we talked about that early on in this lecture. Desmosomes strengthen tissue and hold fibers together during vigorous contractions. Gap junctions provide route for quick conduction of electrical signals throughout the heart. And this is an involuntarily controlled muscle. Another, you can't control it. I mean, maybe I can hold my breath and slow my heart rate down, so my heart's going to be slower. Or I can run around the building, and then my heart rate's going to. So I can control it that, but you can't control your heart. It's an involuntary, involuntarily controlled organ. Its location is in the heart wall, and it pumps blood to all parts of the body. So you can kind of see how it looks a little bit different than the skeletal muscle that we were looking at in the previous slide. still has the striations, but now it's got these things called intercalated discs. looks like it doesn't have as many nuclei as the skeletal muscle does. Smooth muscle. This consists of non-striated fibers. Smooth muscle fiber is a small spindle-shaped cell thickest in the middle, tapering at each end and containing a single centrally located nucleus. Gap junctions connect many individual fibers in some smooth muscle tissue, usually involuntary, and it can produce powerful contractions as many muscle fibers contract in unison. Where gap junctions are absent, such as the iris of the eye, smooth muscle fibers contract individually like skeletal muscle fibers. This is located in the iris of the eyes, the walls of hollow internal structures of the body, such as blood vessels, airways to the lungs, stomach, intestine, gallbladder, urinary bladder, and uterus. Its function is motion, the propulsion of foods through the gastrointestinal tract, contraction of urinary bladder and gallbladder, and the constriction of blood vessels and airways. And you can see that this looks much different from the other two previous types of muscle we were talking about. Nervous tissue, moving on to 4.8 on page 143. Two kinds of cells, the neurons and the neural glia. Most neurons have a cell body, dendrites and axons. Neurons can carry sensory or motor information and they can perform integrative functions. Neuroglia protect and support neurons. Table 410 on page 143 still. Nervous tissue consists of neurons which consist of a cell body and processes extending from the cell body and the neuroglia which do not generate or conduct nerve impulses but have other important functions. Its location is the nervous system its function is to exhibit sensitivity to various types of stimuli. It converts stimuli into nerve impulses, action potentials, which means that it's electrical. 
and it conducts nerve impulses to other neurons, muscle fibers, or glands, and those impulses are going to go to your brain, and you, your brain's going to send impulses back out and tell you how to react to a certain situation. And you can kind of see here in this cartoon how the nerve cell looks. It's got this axon, which is this long part of the cell that connects it to the next cell. It's got a nucleus. It's got dendrites. And then here's the new, so this neuroglial cell is going to uh, surround this nerve and kind of give it some protection. Excitable cells. Neurons and muscle fibers are considered excitable cells because they exhibit electrical excitability. Oh yeah, 4.9, we're still on page 143. Electrical excitability is the ability to respond to certain stimuli by producing electrical signals, such as action potentials, which travel along the plasma membrane of a neuron or muscle fiber due to the presence of specific voltage-gated channel. But really, we're talking about millivolts here, microvolts. It's not very much electricity, but there is some electricity in your body and that is actually just for instance just to give you a quick example the way that your cell phone works is it detects the capacitance in electricity uh, when you have some kind of potential there you have some capacity or some capacitance and that's how your cell phone works it takes the electrical charge that's going through your body and pull up my compass so this uh, phone is detecting the action potential or the capacitance in my finger, and it's converting that into an electrical signal to control your smartphone, if you have a smartphone. If you have a flip phone, not so much. So tissue repair and restoring homeostasis. And homeostasis is the recurring theme of this entire book, this two-inch thick book. So let's talk about tissue repair on page 144 at 4.10. Tissue repair is the process that replaces worn out, damaged, or dead cells. Epithelial cells are replaced by the division of stem cells or undifferentiated cells. Not all connective tissue cells have the ability to repair. For instance, muscle cells can only perform limited repair. Some nervous cells can perform limited repair. Others cannot. Fibrosis is the formation of scar tissue. So sometimes when, let's talk about this for a second. If an organ or part of a tissue becomes damaged, it forms scar tissue, and that scar tissue may prevent the tissue from performing its function, like, for instance. So that's just it. The scar tissue, it, it's how your body uh, heals, and it may uh, you may have a loss of feeling or a loss of function at that point. Now, your book also points out that with young people, babies, or they say that you can operate on a fetus and there, they, there will be no scar uh, from the operation. So younger people have the ability to uh, regenerate uh, more readily than us older people do. Uh, but maybe that's what we're going to talk about here on page 145 at 4.11 with the aging and tissues. Uh, that's why I just said younger bodies generally experience a better nutritional state, a better blood supply to tissue, and a faster metabolic rate. Aging slows the process of tissue repair. Aging also results in the stiffening and loss of elasticity in tissues. Homeostatic imbalances. Uh, this is still on page 145. Disorders of epithelial tissues tend to be specific to individual organs, such as ulcers in the stomach. Disorders of connective tissues tend to be autoimmune in nature, such as lupus. Another popular autoimmune disease is rheumatoid arthritis. Disorders of muscular and nervous tissues will be discussed in later chapters. Uh, so more thing I'd like to say, uh, with an autoimmune disease, what that means is that your body is producing antibodies, and those antibodies actually identify your own tissue as uh, being foreign, and it will attack that tissue. And that's basically what lupus does and what rheumatoid arthritis does. So... That's an autoimmune disease. And that's the end of the lecture tonight.